All right. Let's do this. Friday, going into the weekend. Um, I love the fact that each one of you that are choosing to watch this and to be a part of this every day, that you are prioritizing your, um, your, your relationship with God. And it's just that simple to take time and focus on growing and challenging yourself and being with the Lord and letting him love on you and giving your love back to him. It's, um, it's easy when, when that's something that you've just chosen to make a lifestyle, whether it's with me or someone else or on your own. Um, it's easy to just forget that most people don't do that and allow that to just sink in like the, the pleasure that you're able to give your father by just spending time with him. And in any relationship that we don't spend time with the person and make them feel prioritized, there's um, something missing, you know? And so I guess I just wanna encourage you and say that um, you prioritizing even just a few minutes every day just to be with the Lord and to intentionally grow your relationship with him is huge. It's a big deal. And it's amazing what just a few minutes with him can do to us. Like it, it um, literally will change the trajectory of our day, of our focus. And he's worth that. He is so worth that. So, um, Obviously, it's not about us performing for him or any obligation. He just wants wants it to be an overflow of our hearts. And our hearts, unfortunately, in our flesh, lean towards the path of most comfort and least resistance. And we just lean towards wanting to be entertained and not wanting to have to, you know, press in or... Um, face the things that sometimes stir up in our hearts when we get still long enough to just be with him. So it's a big deal. And I want to jump right back in to where we were talking about this week, our identity as broken ones. And when I first brought that up on Monday, one of the definitions um, of the uh, Greek, what was it? The Greek word? Let's see. Yeah. The Greek word in Luke 20 verse 18, when I read to you about Jesus being the chief cornerstone. And then it says, whoever falls on that stone, meaning Jesus, the, the, the rock, um, will be broken. And so there is a brokenness that we embrace and we even glory in because it represents our weakness, which makes room for his strength. Um, and our inadequacy, which makes room for his righteousness. And his righteousness is not something that, again, is like, you know, a little fat Buddha that sits and we have to put things at his feet. Um, He doesn't need us to put good behavior at his feet. He doesn't need us to perform for him. The father was never looking for us to be good, for us to be perfect. And we had to take this very long, all of time kind of journey as humanity into this place of we aren't good enough. We don't have righteousness in and of ourselves. And I think I shared this with you in the intro video that you watched before we even started this this year. Um, so if I'm repeating myself, I'm sorry. It, um, I can't remember if I told this or not, but I used to teach my kids that, um, you know, the holiness of God or the righteousness of God, his perfection is like the sun, the sunshine up in the sky. It is a ball of fire and it just is what it is. That is the essence of what it is made of. And in the same way, God is um, made up of holiness. He is sheer perfection. And it's not something he has to work at. It is the essence and the core of who and what he is. 
And so obviously if I wanted to get next to the sun, the ball of fire, I'd have to fireproof myself or be fire as well in order to not be consumed by that fire. It wouldn't, wouldn't be that if I got near it and it just burned me up, that the sun was mad at me. Um, it's, it, by its very essence, whatever comes near it has to be like it or be proof from it. And so it's that way with the holiness of God. He wants us near him. And he knew that our own um, perfection would never be good enough for us to draw near him and not be consumed by his holiness. And so he's given us Jesus that has fireproofed us. And um, in this earthly experience, we grow and we become fire ourselves. We become that holiness, that righteousness of Jesus. So we are clothed in his righteousness and then he matures us and grows us up into it. So um, anyway, I think of it kind of like a, a, we clothe ourselves with something that's too big for us and then we grow up into it. So um, why was I bringing that up? <laughs> um, the holiness of God. So when we talk about um, being broken and our own weakness, making room for his strength, it's, uh, it is our delight to put on Jesus, to put on um, Christ as our righteousness. And it's not, you know, we screwed up as humanity and now we need Jesus. And so we just, you know, it, it, that, that's the mentality that the enemy is constantly wanting to put on us. Shame associated with the fact that we need Jesus. And um, that is the pride, that is the arrogance, and that is the shame that prevents the world and many from choosing Jesus. And there are degrees that we can choose Jesus. You know, this is the final day that we're really focusing in on Jesus. Obviously, we're going to keep talking about him the rest of the year, but I mean in a focused way. And so this idea of... Um, there are, there, I say degrees, I don't know what would be a better word, but degrees to which we put on Jesus, that we um, grow up into him. And one, one of those ways is obviously we clothe ourselves in the righteousness of Jesus and the blood of Jesus covers us. So we apply his blood to our lives, to our bodies. Um, another area is the mind of Christ put on the mind of Christ. I should have looked up that scripture for you, but that could be a good weekend assignment for you. Find um, find the things that uh, that are about Jesus that we can embrace and intentionally um, grow up into. And and that idea of the mind of Christ is uh, it's just so powerful. Just the way he thinks. It's an aspect of the kingdom. Because the way Jesus thinks is a, is a mirror of the way our Father thinks. And the way our Father, the King, thinks gives us a hint and a glimpse into how He wants us to think. And um, so this, this idea of the kingdom that we've been talking about all week is so powerful. The kingdom of God and His righteousness. Um, Matthew 6.33 again. Jesus tells us, I want you, it's okay for you to want these other things. Um, I can't remember what all he says there. Well, let's just look at it. Matthew 6, uh, 33, right before that. He's talking about, you know, don't worry. He says, I say to you, this is verse 25, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink. Don't even worry about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? He can't even get taller. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. 
They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today and to, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith or trust? Therefore don't worry, saying, What do we eat and what do we drink? What do we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles, those who don't know me, they seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So that's the point. He knows the things that we need. And I believe our list since then has gotten a lot longer um, in, our, in our advancing as, uh, as a society. Our list of things we need has gotten a lot longer. And, you know, they didn't have the option of a home with walls to live in. Um, well, I guess the kings did. Some of them did. But you know what I'm saying. Like, we've advanced in the things that we need. And he's saying, I understand you need these things. But if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we always leave that part out, and his righteousness all these things will be added to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So it was important to Jesus to make sure that we understood that he really doesn't want us to worry. He doesn't want us to strive for the things around us. And I can tell you, um, I think sometimes for people in ministry, this is a little easier because you, especially if you're pastors and it's a smaller church or you're stepping out and you're doing something in ministry that, um, that you have to raise support or your missionary or whatever. And in some ways it's easier because you're not expected to work hard in order to get these things. Cause they know people know you're supposed to focus on ministry and then you're supposed to believe God for the rest. But I can tell you being kind of forced into that position through the years, Johnny and I have never lacked for anything. God has been, I mean, it's been tight. There have been, you know, those moments where um, we didn't know where the provision was going to come from, but we knew that it would come because it was our father's heart to take care of us because we were seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And it works. I'm telling you, it works. And, and after a while, we learned to not even stress about it. You know, I feel bad for my parents over the years because there are many times where they knew, I know as a parent, you knew what your child needs and you're watching this gap and where is it going to come from? And, you know, they've gotten to grow in their faith with us by them watching God provide for us and our kids through the years. And um, my point with that was I wanted to go back to that emphasis on seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. So it's his righteousness. It's not seek first the kingdom and try to be perfect and just try to be really good and take your be good behavior the best you can and, you know, put it in front of God so that he won't be angry with you and then encourage other people to behave too because if they don't behave, then his judgment's going to come on your nation. And then so y'all all need to just put your good behavior at the feet of this God who needs your good behavior. And I'm exaggerating that to make a point. Um, again, that word righteousness is often um, one of the options in uh, the, the Greek is to translate it as the word justice. And remember, justice isn't vengeance. Justice is bringing things back into right standing, back into alignment, back into alignment specifically with God. And it's, um, it's a word worth studying. Use the concordance and go into that word righteousness and justice and look at all the different scriptures and how those words are used. And ask the Holy Spirit to give you further revelation on that because it is I believe it is the word of our year, this word justice. We are birthing it. So back to we are his broken ones. One of those definitions was to bring to birth. Usually brokenness is um, translated in the obvious way that like we said on Monday, wrecked, crushed, ruptured, maimed, shattered. 
but that word ruptured and bringing to birth kind of go together. Of course, um, when you're in labor, the water, the sac that the baby is in ruptures, and that's a sign that birthing is happening. And I believe literally this very weekend, we are in a time of birthing justice, specifically um, in government and in the nations, in, in this idea of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven coming and pressing in and displacing the kingdoms of the world. It's a big deal. And I wanted to read, uh, okay, so another point about the kingdom before I read something to you. Jesus never, ever, ever preached the kingdom as an idea or a theology or a concept disconnected from the knowledge of the Father, of what the Father is like. He always demonstrated it. He always utilized the power of the kingdom to demonstrate the truth and the reality of the kingdom and the king and his better ways. And so, um, you know, you, you read frequently throughout the, the Gospels that Jesus preached the gospel and healed, preached the gospel, cast out demons, preached, preached the gospel of the kingdom, and, um, and demonstrated it through signs and wonders and miracles. And then he went on to say that even greater would we do. And why would there be a greater? I believe there is a greater because the kingdom of God, he said, is here, but he said it is coming in greater measure. And so as the kingdom of God advances further and further in the earth, of course, its demonstration should mirror it. It should equal it. And so we need to be looking for opportunities to partner with the Holy Spirit in our day-to-day -day lives. I'm going to talk to you about that at the end because um, that's going to be part of the weekend challenge. But we need to be looking for opportunities to bring the kingdom of God, to demonstrate it, and to um, be that evidence of the power and authority of God in people's lives. So, um, I think again in the first video, that the intro video, I spoke to you about this idea of the kingdom is not this ethereal spiritual concept. It is something, it is the tangible expression. It's where the humility of God meets the need of man. And, you know, when we are in need, it can be something as basic as clean water. It can be something as basic as I'm a victim and I need rescuing from an abuser. Um, it can be something all the way up to we've got a, a broken economic system over an entire nation or nations that is based and rooted in so much greed that that people don't have the basics of life and those that do have more than enough they only have it because they um, compromise to get it or they're a slave to the wealth that they that they were able to create um and so <laughs> i keep going on these rabbit trails and then i have to remember where i was going with it um okay so so the kingdom of heaven isn't the spiritual concept. It is something concrete and tangible. It's the humility of God meeting the need of man. The humility of God is that this is a king who doesn't rule and reign from afar. And, you know, maybe lucky somebody, a handful of the citizens of this kingdom will one day get to actually meet this king and maybe even be in his throne room. No, this is a king with so much humility that he invites every single one of his citizens to come near to him and to rule and reign with him and to be in his throne room, in his presence, anytime they want to. That is the humility of a king. And the humility of a king to create these, these um, structures 
in the earth, these structures that we refer to as culture, structures like family, economy, media, our entertainment and arts, um, this idea of a religion uh, versus just a relationship with God, because we do have religion. We have our, our ways of worshiping God. Um, there's uh, the education area of culture, etc. These areas of culture to me represent the humility of God that he would give us in our limited capacity an opportunity to kind of be introduced on this side of heaven to these faces of God, these ways that he can be encountered in this limited space and time called life here on earth. And um, so it's the humility of God that, that that takes the vastness of who and how he is in the universe. And he drops himself into this concept called family that everybody can relate to. And he drops himself into this concept called education that everybody can relate to. We're always continually learning something. And this, this idea of an economy where he provides for us, but he doesn't just provide for us, he partners with us in our provision and then he teaches us to be generous like he is like the humility of god this king is so amazing and that humility is at the heart and center of the kingdom of god and when you get that and you no longer see him as this fat and sassy god this being who wants us to lay our our good deeds before him then we get free of that and the shame that comes with it and we're able to look and see him as the king who is humble and, and comes among us. The Emmanuel, Jesus, who shows up in this limited, like this fallenness compared to all of heaven that is sheer glory and perfection. And you, you, you look at this, um, this idea of the kingdom. And back in the day when they had kingdoms, and there was a king and they didn't have the technology we have now they would um they would have ambassadors of the king who would go into the little towns that were throughout the kingdom and they would take with them an edict or um something written from the king to the citizens that would tell them uh whatever the new law was or the news of the kingdom or something that was going on that they needed to be aware of and a citizen of the kingdom and back in the day could know the heart of their king even if they'd never seen him themselves even if they'd never met him themselves they could know the heart of the king by the 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 um environment of the kingdom that they lived in and by the the truth that the ambassadors would deliver to them and the truth of the laws of that kingdom. And so each one of us have been invited to be ambassadors of the kingdom of God, ambassadors of the heart of our Father, where we, we interact with those that don't yet know him. They may not even be aware they live in a kingdom and, and represent to them by the way we live, by the way we love, by the way we perceive um, and by the, the, the authority that we walk in, the power that we walk in, and simply by the way that we care. We are demonstrating the kingdom of God as ambassadors of the kingdom. And it is so important that we're aware of that, of the fact that we are ambassadors. Even if you feel like, like you're just now getting started on how much you know of God and, and Jesus and the Father, it's okay. What you know is always more than what someone else knows. And I'll go ahead and give you the weekend challenge. The weekend challenge is start intentionally noticing what you care about. And then begin to have a conversation with Jesus because he was the master of this. He learned and demonstrated what it looks like to care about what the Father cares about and then bring and partner with a solution from the Father 
and bring it into a tangible moment. And that spark of caring that Jesus referred to as compassion, it was, it was the spark of compassion in Jesus that would always bring the demonstration of the kingdom to someone's physical body or, um, you know, dispelling a demon that had um, that someone needed to be delivered from, etc. Uh, multiplying fish and bread, all the supernatural things that happen. You know, uh, Peter was it Peter walking on the water. Um, anyway, all of those were demonstrations of his message of the kingdom, and and he is inviting us to partner with him. So this weekend, I want to challenge and provoke you to something. Um, here's an example of it. I, I remember, uh, was it a Christmas or some special occasion? My parents gave um, all of us kids and grandkids a hundred dollars each. Doesn't have to be that much, but they gave us a hundred dollars each, and we were all so excited. We we're like, woo! And he said, wait. My dad said, wait. We have something that we're going to ask of you to do with this one hundred dollars. Actually, I think they gave us. Maybe I'm remembering this wrong. I think they gave us $200 and they gave a hundred for us and a hundred um, for us to do this with. And they said, we want you to take this hundred dollars and we want you, as long as it takes, just ask Holy Spirit to show you someone that needs this and give it to them and just ask him how to present it to them, whether you, you know, mail it and, um, give them a note or someone you meet on the street, whatever, it's wide open, however Holy Spirit wants to lead you. And so my, my point with that, um, oh, and then they, they said, we want to hear, the only thing we ask of you is we want to hear back from you the story of whatever it was, what provoked your heart, what happened, how did they receive it? And it was amazing. I remember the um, $100 that they gave me, Johnny and I were on a trip and we stopped at a gas station and there was, um, there was this guy, I remember his eyes. Um, I was getting a drink at the fountain, the drink fountain, and, and he was getting a cup of coffee. And um, maybe he wasn't, he was just kind of standing there a little awkwardly and it was obvious that, it, that he was homeless. He was pretty young, maybe in his 20s. And um, we were both standing in a close space and I looked at him and I, and I said, how are you? And he like looked at me and something in him, just like the guard just came down. He said, um, I can't remember what he said, but he, he was just vulnerable. And I said, I listened to him and I just, I just said something about, um, how much the Lord loved him. And I said, come here, I want you to pick out some things that, um, that you would enjoy eating. And, and he just got tears in his eyes and he said, I was just about to steal, um, food because I, I'm so hungry. Anyway, long story short, the guy was totally impacted. Um, I have so many of those stories. I just can't even remember them all. And, and there's something about locking eyes with someone and looking at them and making them feel seen making them feel heard. And it doesn't have to be a homeless person. It can be your neighbor. Literally, it could be somebody who, um, you know, it doesn't have to be money. It can be a word. Um, one of the things that I'll frequently do is I'll go into a store. If I'm not in a hurry. And it's kind of hard right now with the whole stupid mask thing. But um, I'll go into a store and and say, God, just show me somebody to encourage. That's it. Just somebody to encourage. I'm not trying to seal the deal. I'm not trying to get somebody to pray to receive Christ. Um, that that's great if that happens. But I just wanna, I just wanna show up on your behalf, Lord, and show somebody how much you care about them. And so usually somebody will just, I just feel drawn to them. If somebody could look perfectly fine, normal, or somebody could look, you know homeless or very sad or whatever, but I'll just go to them and I'll just like, you're really chill. Just be like, Hey, I'm sorry. You caught my attention. And, um, I, I don't, don't want to like make you feel put on the spot or anything, but 
I'm a Christian and every day, I say this really fast, I'm a Christian and every day I ask God to show me somebody to encourage. And he gave me um, something to encourage you with. Are you okay if I share that with you really quick? And I've only one time had somebody say no. <laughs> and and they like, sure. And I try to ask the Lord before that moment, like, what is it? What do you love about them? Or I'll ask the Lord a question. What do you love about them? Or what do they need encouraging about? And I'll just take that one little thing that God gave me and just start with that. And sometimes it grows into something more while I'm talking. Sometimes it's just that simple. You know, he just wanted me to say he sees what you're going through right now and he loves you so much. And, um, you know, you we've been basking in how much he loves us now for almost two months. You've got an overflow of that love. And it will just come out of you, even if you don't know ahead of time what it is. So I'm going to ask you to just step out in some way this weekend. If you're not leaving your house, then go online, go on somebody, go find a stranger. You know, some kid on on uh, social media that just seems, you just seem drawn to them, whatever. You can um, message them and say, you know, I promise I'm not being creepy. I asked the Lord to give me somebody to encourage today and he highlighted your profile. And so here goes. And then just type away whatever the Lord shows you, something that's encouraging, something that's hopeful. Um, it's that treasure hidden in the field that you're looking for. And, and then on Monday, when we're back together, I'm going to remind you and I'm going to ask you to put in the comments on Monday um, a little story just how you did it, something that will provoke us um, to want to keep doing this. So when you hear other people's stories, um, you get ideas of how to step out yourself. And, um, you know, it can be discouraging because you hear people like maybe Sean Bolts, who gets, you know, very specific detailed stuff. But what I have found is that on those rare occasions when I've gotten really specific detailed stuff, yes, people are impacted. But they're never impacted more than when I've given them an encouraging word that was just a slight impression in my heart and I ran with it. It, it, it struck their heart in the same way. So the bottom line is on a small individual scale and on the biggest worldwide scale of all, the enemy does not want the kingdom of God demonstrated and coming to earth in an advanced way. So we have the opportunity to um, do it in this space. <laughs> and and uh, okay, so that was your weekend challenge. Um, I was going to read to you a little something from here. So I'm going to do that really fast and then give you the songs. Um, so we're birthing justice right now. And so I pulled from my book, God in Every Season. It's not available right now, but it is on audiobook. And it is on um, available as a PDF download or Kindle, um, God in Every Season. We're going to be reprinting it soon. But here's the deal. Um, one of the chapters that I wrote was on the season of our soul that we go through with God called Spring Justice. So there's winter, spring, summer, and fall. And spring justice. Spring is a season in our relationship with God that, um, that is all about birthing his justice. And we cycle through these seasons in our individual relationships with God. But just like um, if you look at the inner workings of a watch, you can see that there are wheels within wheels, gears within gears. And in the same way, we have these individual seasons that we cycle through with the Lord, but I believe that cities and nations and humanity itself also has these seasons. So there are seasons within the bigger seasons, within the greater seasons. And um, God says that we can know the times and seasons in him when we're connected to him. And so I believe there is this incredible alignment right now of Many, many, many individuals that are have felt stuck in the spring season of trying to birth justice, the redemptive storyline of God for their own lives. We have felt stuck in this for a long time, 
and our nation right now and i believe many other nations are stuck in this this season that seems like forever of trying to birth justice and um so out of that place i have written this chapter on spring justice i'm just going to read to you um the last page and a half from that chapter and one of the things that i do with each of the seasons is i i use this picture of a tree to um to show the seasons we go through so obviously imagine a tree that goes through winter spring summer and fall well spring is a time of testing and spring like a growing tree proverbs 13 12 says hope deferred makes the heart sick but desire fulfilled is a tree of life remember that we talked about hope and we are his hopeful ones and hope is into the anticipation of the goodness of god in all areas of life so justice is always connected to hope um our our daughter justice her name is justice hope and that's where this revelation came from but justice hope we are we are birthing out of our out of we conceived in this place of hope um, his justice being birthed through us the tree in spring begins to show signs of life and buds of fruitfulness hope is no longer suspended in air things begin to feel healthy again the spring season of your soul is a special time of anointing to get things done in the same way that a tree that survived the long winter may be tempted to just bask in the new long sunny days rather than do the hard work that's required in spring, you may miss critical opportunities that only spring brings. If you want productive seasons to follow, and what's the productive season that we want to follow um, in the earth right now? The productive season is we want the great awakening. We want revival, we want reformation. So if you want productive seasons to follow, you must realize the purpose of this season of spring birthing justice. Isaiah 55, 6 says it like this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Of course, he's always near, but in spring, it's easier to feel his nearness. So it's time to let your roots go deeper and your branches reach higher. Trees do most of their growing and developing in springtime. There's now an abundance of water and the tree instinctively knows that the days are now long enough, making each, excuse me, making enough sunlight accessible for it to begin awakening the buds of tiny leaves that have been dormant. Have you felt like things in your life and in our nation have been dormant? In order to ready for the heat of summer, because every season has its own testing, it does its most intense work now. These Speaking of trees, because it's all happening so fast and with intensity, it needs a lot of food that can that can only come as its roots go deep to find more water and minerals. It then must deliver that nutrient rich sap all the way up to the leaves that are fully seen by the end of spring. Our leaves are for the healing of the nations, the tree, the leaves on the tree and you are wrecked oaks of righteousness our leaves on the tree are for the healing of the nations what we're supposed to produce is something that heals individual hearts heals individuals bodies and heals collective areas of culture and ultimately society itself the healing of the nations all right um, the added new weight of growing branches and leaves up top forces the tree to grow more under the ground as well. What new weights of responsibility is God allowing you the privilege to steward over? Don't get stuck in the spring season of your soul because you aren't willing to go deeper in order to maintain those things. Ultimately, we discover that what we're wanting even more than the thing we're laboring to birth, the healing, the finances, the breakthrough in, in a heart issue or a relationship, etc or laboring to birth justice in the nation. This is what, what means more to us than anything is what it represents to us. So we're not trying to just, you know, make the world a, a utopia for the sake of living in a utopia. We are not trying to heal America to go back to the American way of life. 
That is not the goal. We're not trying to get rid of socialism and evil in America so that we can go back to being the America we were before. Yes, there are roots we need to go back to, but God is doing something new and something different. And it is called the kingdom of God. It's not called the American way of life. And it happens in the context of freedom, which is at the heart of the American life. But we grew it into something else. We grew it into this, this independence. I can do things my way, and therefore any way that anybody wants is the way of America. We're going back to the kingdom of God. We're not going back to the American way of life. And if we demonstrate it properly, people will love living in the midst of the kingdom of God coming to earth because they'll still have the freedom to choose or not choose. Anyway, okay, I just went off on a tangent. Um, all right, back to this quick quote. When long, oh, what, what I was saying is it was, it's what it represents to us. So if, if something that we're birthing in terms of justice in our own lives, um, is what it represents to us. It's not just, okay, I'm, I'm sick physically and I need to feel better. Yeah, I want to feel better. But I also, like at this point, need proof that God actually cares that I wasn't feeling good. It's, it's what it's connected to and what the message that it sends our hearts. So as we heal these broken areas of culture and the people around us benefit from that, it's, it's great that they will experience, you know, a better economic system, a, a healthier education system, etc. But it's what it speaks to their heart, what it represents to them. Wow, like my family is whole again. And I feel safe when I go to school. And I feel like I have a chance at, at um, a healthy economy. All of that, it's what it represents to them, which is ultimately, because all of our hearts are conditioned because of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and how we view God through our circumstances, it acclimates their hearts to believe there's a God who cares and used Christians, of all people, to bring healing to the nation. It's what it represents to them. Okay, I made that point. When longings of the heart are fully answered, it means that he showed up on our behalf. And if he showed up on our behalf, it becomes the proof that our heart wants and needs, that we matter to him, that he cares about us, that we are important and he is good. When we keep our hope glasses on, he is good, then if we can't see him show up on our behalf in the way we expected it, we know that he has surely shown up on our behalf in another way. The question becomes, where is the evidence of his goodness? That's the question. How you answer it in this season of your soul is to your benefit. So don't settle for any answer that doesn't come out of full conviction and absolute resolve that he is indeed good. Looking forward, justice will bloom and the hope you've grabbed a hold of will produce a harvest. But first comes a testing and a tending to what has beautifully emerged in the soil of your heart. Embrace a hope for justice to be fully seen in your life story and leave no room in this season for regrets. For as quickly as the sun has made its grand entrance on your horizon, it will soon bring the grace that will be required for the intensity of the noonday heat that is coming with the next season. But the season we're in right now, there is a birthing, and when there is a birthing in the natural, there are waves of it. And there is a rhythm that you have to find in the midst of birthing that if you don't find, um, it, it makes the process a lot more difficult. And that rhythm is Holy Spirit saying, it's time to rest. It's time to pull back. And then it's time to press in. It's time to deliver what is in you. And there is a rhythm of that even in our nation right now that God is birthing justice in. And I don't really know how to put that into words very clearly, but I'm just trying to give you the heads up to pay attention to your, your labor coach right now, Holy Spirit. He's the one right there in your ear whispering to us collectively. And many of you are intercessors. And there are going to be times even this very weekend where he's going to say, and, and it'll continue on through. I think the birthing is, 
is actually just about to begin. And I think that it's going to be however long birth takes. And you never know going into it if it's going to be a quick delivery or if it's going to be something that you think you're never going to get on the other side of. But when there is a birthing, it's important to listen to the coach and, and rest at the moments that, that, that you need to rest and push and press in at the moments that you need to. And um, there's, in the spirit realm right now, we are very vulnerable and, um, and, yet, and yet this is gonna happen. This is gonna happen. There is a justice that is going to be birthed and it is the kingdom of God. It is his righteousness. So, okay, I've gone really long today. I don't think I've ever gone 46 minutes. Um, but it felt important headed into this weekend. So um, the songs are, I've got four songs for you. And I'll put them in the title of this. Um, Kingdom of God by John Guerra. We the Kingdom God So Loved by, um, well, it's Storybook Sessions. And Jesus Be the Center by David Funk and Oh Praise the Name by Christine DeMarco. Um, all four of those, just that blend of Jesus and continuing to focus on him and what he's done and, and him partnered with um, the Father and bringing heaven to earth, the kingdom of God demonstrated. You cannot separate, as E. Stanley Jones title of his book, you cannot separate the unshakable kingdom, and the unchanging person. And when you go through a birth, there is a shaking. All of your muscles, you know, are working so hard, and you literally shake. It's, it's exhausting. And, um, and yet what, is, what you feel like is breaking you is actually birthing something so incredible. And it's always worth it. What does a woman do as soon as she's done with labor is she holds that baby and she cries because she's so happy. And um, there, there are tears right now, but, but uh, they're going to be tears of joy. I know that. I know that I know that I know. So um, thank you, Jesus, for just doing what you did and demonstrating your kingdom and showing us the heart of our father, our king. I ask that you would just set each one of us up this weekend to, to, um, to demonstrate your kingdom to another person in a very specific way. Would you highlight that for us? Would you walk us through it? And, um, we, we are excited about partnering with you in that way this weekend and sharing those stories with each other and bragging on um, what happens when you, um, when you use our voice to speak to someone else's heart. We love you so much and we love being loved by you. In Jesus name we pray, amen. Love all of you, thanks for hanging with me this long and um, for all your encouraging words, I, um, go back frequently and read through your comments and just y'all are so encouraging all the time. Um, and you've got great comments in here. Yep. So good. All right. Love y'all. Bye.